Good morning. How are you? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> a civil rights circus screamed the front page of the Grant's Daily Beacon, Friday, April 10, 1981. It's a list which reads like a who's who of the anti-nuke activists. Senator Pete Domenici brought into the fray by the Grant's mayor, Mitch Wells. The senator said he had no idea that the civil rights hearing was occurring. What we have now is an absolute disaster with two pro-nukes and two anti-nukes. We need a new commissioner, said uh, Senator Pete Domenici. Okay, so with that introduction, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about my experiences living and working in Grants, New Mexico during the second boom. Okay, <clears throat> you can show the next picture. <clears throat> a preferred nuclear bomb's energy frequently comes from the bones of Jurassic thunder lizards. After their death and burial under tons of rock, sand, and water, their bones gradually absorb the surrounding minerals like uranium if it's present. As the bones are ground down, energy in the form of gamma rays is released to be sucked into a miner's mouth as he drills into the squished dinosaur remains. A mechanical counter, a Geiger counter, can detect these rays above or below ground. By the 1970s, the dangers of gamma rays were well known. The uranium miners had to wear dosimeters, which the safety people monitored. The miners were made to leave an area that had an unsafe level of gamma rays. The miners did not like the decimeters or the safety people. We're paid by the tonnage, not for our safety. The, in the 1950s, the little town of Grants grew carrots and lived a sleepy little life until international events beckoned a ragtag bunch of get-rich-quick people and to drive their trucks to the concrete wigwam motels along Route 66. Some of the purest uranium was being found around Grants and north, and north of Grants. The town exploded with prospectors, drillers, hustlers, ladies of questionable repute, all looking to find that ore, the yellow rock or the hole that set off the Geiger counter. Old timers tell me that everyone wanted to get into the action. It was a dog eat dog. By way of illustration, I'll introduce you to bearded, bearded old Gus Rainey. And first, you need to know about claiming your spot and keeping it while exploring it. To secure your claim to a particular piece of land, you had to begin drilling it or digging, digging in it. But watch out, another eager man might learn of your good luck, or maybe you're bragging over a beer at a local bar and start drilling on your land, or as they say, jump your claim. Okay. And... Gus Rainey told me how he was hired to stand guard by a new shaft the prospector was digging. My stove had a st my truck had a stove for cooking coffee and beans, a bed next to the stove. I always had my rifle ready. About a week after digging, the digging man had hired him. The man was sweating and digging into the ground. Gus was standing watch on the back of his pickup. Three men came bouncing over the juniper and rocks up to Gus's pickup. Get off of my land, Gus shouted. He pointed the rifle at the pickup truck with the three men. What's he paying you to keep watch, the driver of the pickup asked in a loud voice. Ten bucks a week, Gus said. I'll pay you twenty, the man shouted. Gus said he turned around, pointed his rifle at the man in the hole in the ground and said, get off my land. <laughs> okay. Then there was Stella Dysart was another entrepreneur. She owned promising land at Ambrosia Lake, which, in, which is found to be a rich source of uranium. She also founded a church that in fact you had to join when you bought a small piece of land above and, or and below ground. She sold these small shafts around the country by mail. After she died and Kermagee and Homestead wanted to purchase the entire plot, it was discovered that not only did these little shafts, about a foot square, crowd next to one another, um, the ownership could oftentimes not be verified because she lost track of who bought what. She just kept selling these little shafts. Okay. The ownership could not be verified, and the mining operations had to curb around all the shafts that she had, had sold. 
Haystack Mountain, just outside of Grants to the west, is also a, a great source of uranium. The story goes that the guy who owned the land, Patty Martinez, a Navajo man, fell asleep. He fell off of his donkey and fell asleep on the hillside. When he woke up in the morning, he noticed a few rocks with telltale yellow color. He decided to take them to the assayer, and he learned that indeed they were radioactive. Then he had to try to figure out where in the world was he when he fell off his donkey. But he found out, and since then they've had a, a huge bunch of money coming out of that. Now, okay, second boom, 1977. I found work at New Mexico State University at Grants. I was fresh from back east campus, anti-war, anti-segregation, pro-environmental, noisy demonstrations. Already 42 years old with kids and a couple of divorces, I showed up that fall to teach anthropology at, at Grants. It was enjoying its second boom. The U.S. government again decided it wanted nuclear. Kermagee, Homestack, and Anaconda had swallowed up all the small digs. Miners came from northern New Mexico, Melodium mines, and Louisiana hard rock mines, put their skills in the uranium projects, and get paid quite well. Can you put another picture? Okay. It was a dirty, dangerous job. <laughs> That's the early mine shaft. Okay. It was a there was a fairly strong movement against uranium mining at this time, through though in the cities. Grants was not a hotbed of environmentalists. The mayor, the Grants Daily Beacon, the university and local entertainment all welcomed the miners in their cash. The miners were famous for freely spending their lucrative salaries and spend they did on mobile homes, big trucks, and beer. The first class I taught in introductory anthropology hunkered in on heavy, noisy boots and dusty jeans. The men all seemed too big to fit in the little student desks. They were already working every day underground, but had opted to take a class is because they got paid to do that too. As one man told me, this is no handout. I work hard for my money. I began a campaign to let me go down with the mining class one day. Finally, after weeks of pestering the trainer, the next picture, and the next picture, there. We, um, and I was given permission to go down one time. The morning came, I donned old Levi's and hiking boots. I met the men at, men at 6 a.m. for a 30-minute ride to Kermagee Section 23 at Ambrosia Lake. At the mine, I was given a helmet with a light on the brim. We crowded into a small cage that shuttered down what seemed forever to me. Crash, we stopped. Electric lights illuminated the metal tracks, black walls, and timbers. Uranium, of course, is found in the sandstone, which needs timbering on the sides and over, overhead. The miner's lights dance up and down the gray wet. I can't see anything except what's lit up directly in front of my light. An older man volunteers to take me around. We tramp on single file. Okay, next picture. There. That's me back there. Well, not really, but... <laughs> Um, let me see. The miner's lights dance up and down in their way wet. An older man volunteers take me around. Ground is wet and puddled. Can you tell me a story about the mine? I asked the dark figure in front of me. Long pause. I can't think of any. How far down are we? I asked. Pretty far. Do you like doing this? It's okay. He answered, we walk and walk and walk. Finally, there's a wall, the end. Here's a little coal car and men standing around. The helmet lights bounce up and down. One man holds a heavy drill, which is drilling into a wall. Water and pieces of rock splatter in front of me. Front of the next picture. There you go, there he is. Here, you want to try? Sure, I could hardly hold the heavy thing. I'm not about to ask him to turn it on. Ooh, it's really heavy. I think I'll pass. I'll watch you guys. Yeah, the men laugh. At that moment, a flurry of rocks and dirt came showering down on me. I jumped over the tracks to hug the wall. I waited for a collapse. Now the men are leaning on their shovels, and they're really laughing at me. A couple of them choked on their cigarettes. Wow, you really took off across those tracks. After this, I stood 
around breathing the pumped in air till time to clamber back up into the cage for the speedy clanging ascent. On the way back to campus, not far from the mine works was a long single line of at least 20 cars and trucks slowly inching their way forward. They would creep up to a small building with a window, Jay's Bar. A man and his buddies can finish a six pack on their way home because Ambrosia Lake is way out in the middle of nowhere. Okay, uh, next picture. There's the man in the bar, next picture. Okay, there he's loading dynamite into that hole that the guy drilled. One morning, after I had been discussing evolution and archeology, span one of my students said he had seen an entire backbone along the wall down in section 23. Oh my God, really? I was, because I'm an anthropologist, so of course, I love that. And I said, does Kermagee know about that? He had no idea. I reasoned to myself that Kermagee wouldn't mind closing down their operation <laughs> long enough to chisel out those bones. I had no proof of his claim, but figured it was a possibility. I did not realize that if the pumps are turned off, so a vertebrae could be carefully chiseled out of the wall, everything would flood. The shafts and tunnel tunnels would collapse. In fact, they keep they're pumping to this day, as far as I know. They keep pumping every day. Next time I didn't have any classes, I put on my nice clothes, drove out to the mine. I was gonna told to go to a wooden shack to find the manager. A middle-aged man in shirt sleeves sat behind a desk. The walls were bare, and the matter stand man stared at me. Good morning, I'm Dr. Carol Sullivan from NSU here in Grant. I'm in charge of this operation, he said. I explained my concern about the dinosaur vertebrae down in the mine. <laughs> we could learn so much from those bones, I urged. Think of it. That animal walked around here a hundred million years ago. He looked at me. Thanks for the information. I need to get back to work. He opened the door and I walked out. I felt I had done the right thing. I felt pretty good about myself. Finals for my class, early May, test results were dismal. They, these would not be acceptable in any college back east. I didn't see why I should let them go. So I flunked some of the students, some of the minors, and gave Ds to the rest of them. A few days go by. The university coordinator asked me to meet him in his office. Dust and construction nurses accompanied me. I asked after I went in, by the way, when the new building is done, where will my office be? You won't have an office. We're letting you go after this semester. Why? He smiled mirthlessly and said, you don't bite the hand that feeds you. Okay. Now I found work in a state agency selling ads and also as a stringer for the Albuquerque Journal. And for the journal, I said, well, I'll do an article on uh, lady miners underground. Okay. So the lady miner assignment found me sitting in a small bar somewhere out in the desert talking with leathered and chain lesbians, most of whom were minors. We are given a hard time by the men, lots of grab ass and insults, one woman said. But then I was looking for abandoned mines. Can you turn the picture? There you go. Well, looking for abandoned mines, I walked all over the desert. First time I peered down a round bottomless hole, which I could easily have fallen into, my knees shook. It takes a long time for a rock thrown down to finally thud to a stop or a splash. There are hundreds of these holes. Often you don't even know they're there as the wooden structures around them have collapsed. My financial situation at this point was pretty dire. I did what any academic would do. I started a nonprofit. <laughs> How easy is that? I used Robert's rules of order to write it down. We didn't get any money to demonstrate Adobe making, but we did get a little money to open an attached solar greenhouse for the townspeople. We had a solar greenhouse opening with green beer because it was St. Patrick's Day. I began writing proposals. All told, I wrote 68 proposals and received 68 rejection letters. As soon as I picked up the letter from the mailbox, I could tell it was a rejection because it was only one page. Okay. I applied <laughs> to be a social worker, an ag teacher, a counselor in a rehab center, a grants coordinator, a counselor in Silver City, an alcohol counselor, a consultant for All Indian Pueblo Council, even wrote a program trying to write a program about grants. And 
here's another story. So grants is booming back in the 70s, early November 1978. Young, likable Earl is drilling underground for homestake mine. He began to cough and cough till the superintendent sent him home. He coughed all afternoon till mother and brother called an ambulance to take him to choking young man to UNM hospital. He continued to talk and died that night. His heart stopped and he could not breathe. All the grants came to the funeral. Earl's mother tried to throw herself in the, gra in the grave. I was a friend of Earl's older brother and wanted to know how a healthy young man could just die. Shouldn't Homestake have warned his family that he had inhaled toxic fumes because he walked near where they were dynamiting and to get him to the hospital? I found a civil rights attorney who agreed to meet with the family. Shortly after this, the family received a letter from Homestake stating that their investigation found that their son was a pot smoker and he had carelessly, more or less, probably wandered into the toxic dust. The letter stated that Earl's pot smoking would be uh, made public at any trial. The family dropped their suit. <clears throat> Though gamma rays are exceedingly dangerous, nobody in grants seem to worry about it or, being, or it's being found in the water lying in the ground after or during drilling. Water around mining areas has been found to be highly radioactive. I attended meetings in Albuquerque of the anti-nuke people such as CARD or SWAP. These meetings would inform participants of the current efforts to stop mining and showcase persons who felt their miscarriages or cancers were caused by nearby mining. In 1982, there was a lot of concern over mining and uranium miners. And a UNM study found significant effects of uranium miners among the men who worked in the mine in their lungs. Okay. I talked to two families who lived near a two-story high waste tailing pile. These were mountains of unacceptable, meaning be below desirable levels of radioactivity ore. The ore is still radioactive. During rainstorms and dust storms, blinding radioactive dust blew across the roads and any homemaker's nearby mobile home. These pilings are ubiquitous around any underground mining. You can't see your hand in front of your face when the wind gets to blowing. I know I should move away, but it's expensive to move to town, said one young mother standing in the shadow of a waste tail piling. She seemed resigned to this situation. She watched her two young daughters play in the sand. In fact, the foundations and much of the cement used to build local houses, bridges, and roadways in the 50s was mixed with low-grade low uranium mining. It's a good, cheap filler. You can get your house assay to see if it's radioactive, though I don't know what you'd do about it anyway. Besides, the mayor told me, your house is built out of the lumber they got from old boxcars, as if to point out it wasn't worth much anyway. One of my anti-nuke Albuquerque friends wanted to educate the town folks about the dangers of uranium mining. He asked me to invite my friends to come to my house and he would show the movie Silkwood. He would discuss the movie about the fate of the whistleblower who many thought was killed because of her activism about nuclear energy. I invited a few friends who I thought might be interested. Nobody came. <laughs> he arrived with his projector and his film, turned out the lights, pulled the shade, nobody came. You need to be careful, you'll be another Karen Silkwood, he said. Oh, come on. I said, you're being paranoid. They just think I'm a nutcase, actually. The future in, in grants is not so bad here at the present time. Mining is slowing down. Unemployment is up. Women, minorities, and natives feel the pinch. Okay. Isn't it ironic? One guy wrote in the paper that after they've gone flat broke for their from their own greed. The New Mexico Civil Rights Commission. Can you put up the next? There. Uh, decided to hold two days of hearings to determine the impact of the single industries leaving. The hearings were met with scorn by the local leadership. Now the next. And see, hard time. Now the next one. There. This is what the beacon thinks of the civil rights circus, screams the front page headline, which we've already talked about. And the Civil Rights Commission, Ernest Gerlach, said 
he wrote me a letter shortly after that and said, I was a little surprised at the reaction of the mayor and other officials in Grants toward the open meetings. In a way, I think he might agree. Grants has some serious problems. Perhaps it's the isolation or the dependence on one major industry. I would be reluctant to classify it as a malaise of sorts, but it approaches a point where the community becomes extremely defensive about itself. And that's it. Thank you.